the book of Psalms today. We are in Psalm number 50, and we, no, this is our 50th study in the book of Psalms. Actually, we are in Psalm 112, and we begin our study today in verse 5. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading in Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. And now verse 5. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. That's a good man. He shows favor and he lends. And God tells us in His Word to be open-handed and freely lend people whatever they need. Someone says, well, sure, I'll do that for my closest friends and maybe my family members. Someone says, I'll I'll lend to them who are nice to me. Well, that's no problem. Well, that's great. But actually, Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. In other words, what Jesus said was be kind to the unworthy, those that you think are unworthy. And we are like God when we do that because He is kind to us and we are all unworthy sinners. Six, surely He shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be held in everlasting remembrance. The righteous shall be held in everlasting remembrance. People remember good people. People want to. The reason a righteous person is remembered is because remembering them, how they were, the good they did, is such a blessing. Their goodness made people happy, and people like happy memories. And so they they will remember righteous people. You got a relative who died, maybe a parent who was very nice to you, and you think about them because they were good, and it brings back happy memories. Their goodness made people happy and People like happy memories, so they remember them. Their holiness is inspiring, and good people like to be inspired unto holiness, so they remember that. That's why biographies such as George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and if you're an evangelical, D.L. Moody, are so inspiring. These guys need to be remembered. Their love for God, their dedication to what was right. Seven. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And it's not that good people never have bad news. It's just that the closer one is to Jesus, the more they will trust in Jesus, and the less they will fear bad news. They'll get bad news like everybody else, but they won't fear it because of trust in Christ. The righteous can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Verse 8. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees his desires upon his enemies. His heart is established, meaning there's confidence in the righteous person. One of the nice byproducts of a close walk with Jesus is confidence. The better one knows God, 
the more they trust God and the less they fear anything. When you are close to Jesus, you know that everything is going to be okay in the end. And if there are hard times for a while, well, God will use them to accomplish something. You know it. And so there's confidence comes as a byproduct of a close walk with Jesus. 9. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. Now, it says that he has given to the poor and that his righteousness endureth forever. A person cannot earn a righteous standing with God by being generous to those who need help. You can't earn it. You can't be generous to people who need help and earn a right standing with God apart from faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, being generous is not a substitute for faith in Christ. However, there is a clear connection between being kind to the needy and saving faith. God says that He will give glory and honor and peace to those who do good. 10. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. The wicked shall see it. See what? The righteous in the righteous enjoying themselves. The righteous being exalted. The wicked are going to see that. And it's going to vex them. They'll be vexed because they will not have the good that God's people will enjoy. They will not be happy like God's people will be happy. They'll see it. And it's going to bother them. Not only because they don't have it, but because somebody else does. And so part of hell's torment is that the desire of the wicked will not be satisfied. None of their desires will be satisfied. And they will have desires. They will have their thirst, but it will not be quenched. They will have their hunger, but it will not be satisfied. They will have their cravings, but they will be unable to satisfy those cravings as well. And you think about this verse. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. The desire of the wicked will perish. I emphasize that because this idea that after death, sinners simply carry on with their good times, their good time friends. You know, life goes on forever and ever. It's the rock and roll heaven idea is a lie promoted by the father of lies to keep people from seeing the truth about hell. People are lulled into believing that when they die, oh, they're going to go to this wonderful rock concert with all the dead rock and rollers or whoever. You know, and it's just going to be so wonderful because they're all going to be together again and they're all going to have fun and it's just going to go on and on and on. Even though they excluded God from their life and of course they don't want God at all. What a lie. Psalm 113. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. It says, Praise ye, O servants of the Lord. No one can really praise God unless they are a servant of God. If a person isn't living for God, praise is stale and lifeless and eventually fades away into nothing. There's no joy in singing praise to God if you're not a servant of God. Verse 2. Let's read 1 and 2 together. Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language. Judah was his sanctuary, and Israel his dominion.
Oops, I read the wrong verse. Let's read verse 2 of Psalm 113. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. There is never a time when God should not be praised. God is good even when times are not good. And His absolute holiness makes Him worthy to be praised. He is worthy of praise because of what He is like. He is worthy of praise all the time because of who He is. 3. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised all day, everywhere. His name is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. In other words, from the east to the west. That is, God should be praised everywhere in this world. And wherever we may be, in whatever situation we find ourselves, we should praise God. And someday that's the way it's going to be. Someday, every knee will bow before Jesus. Every one and every part of the new earth will be redeemed and they will serve Jesus and they will bow before the Lord no matter where they are on this planet. 4. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. The Lord is high above all nations. That title, the Lord, refers to the one who has authority over others. This is it. This verse teaches saying that God has authority over all people and all nations everywhere. He has authority over them. The most powerful weapon we have against nations who do not like us is not our military. The most powerful weapon that we have against nations who do not like us is prayer to God for peace. If every person in America, including those in charge, repented and prayed to God for peace, maybe our enemies would become our friends. 5. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Well, there is no God but God and there is no one like God either it is impossible to compare God to anything or anyone because all comparisons fall way short God is one and he is one of a kind and there is no other but him verse 6 let's read 5 along with 6 this is a this is a great verse Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and on earth? God has to lower himself to even notice his creation. It It is an act of condescension to even notice his creation. God is so holy and he is so exalted that it is a it is an act of extreme humility for him to take the time to even look at us multiply his humility times infinity when he became one of us and then multiply that humility by infinity twice when he died on the cross to pay for our sins. So, if it is an act of humility for God to even notice his his creation, including us, if that's an act of humility, what must it be for him to become one of us? And further, what must it be for him after becoming one of us to die on the cross for us? It's beyond our imagination. Seven. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill. In other words, what he is saying here is that God makes life better. 
no matter what circumstances we are called to live in. Life with God makes life better. Your situation, whatever it is, will be the best that it possibly can be if you're living that life with God. He makes life better. Life with God exalts any situation, any state of being to a form of service to God. It exalts any job to a form of service to God. God gives purpose to any situation that we may find ourselves in. Verse 8. Let's read 7 along with it. 7 and 8 together. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. When and if it suits God's purpose, he can take one of the lowliest of his followers and without references or anything else that is important in this world, without resumes, without anything that is important in this world, God can elevate that humble believer to a prominent place if he chooses to do that. He did it with Joseph down in Egypt, and he did it overnight. Verse 9, He maketh the barren woman to keep house, he maketh the barren woman to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Unexpected blessing. And the principle is this. When we give ourselves completely over to God, He will do things in us, and He will do things through us, and He will do things for us that we never could have even imagined. And maybe they will not be physical things. Maybe they will not be material things, but for, for sure they will be spiritual things. Psalm 114, verse 1. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of a strange language, God did for Israel what they never could have done for themselves. They would still be slaves in Egypt today if God had not delivered them. Either that or they would have faded away and eventually just been wiped out the way the Egyptians were throwing them into the Nile River when they were born. So what God did for Israel they never could have done for themselves. He did what was in their best interest. God always has the best interest of His people in mind. That's why he does the things that he does. That's why he literally grabbed Lot and his family and pulled them out of Sodom before it was destroyed because they lingered. They were taking too much time. They were too slow. But God had their best interest in mind. He pulled them out of there. It says, When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language, Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. Israel became a nation at Mount Sinai after they left Egypt. And at the same time, God, God became their king. At the foot of Mount Sinai, when Moses gave the people the law that God had given to him, they agreed that they would obey and that God would be their God. He became their king at that moment. And that's why when they later insisted on having a human king, they were rejecting God. They were impeaching God like he had done a bad job. They didn't want him to be king anymore. But talking about when Israel came out of Egypt, verse 1, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language, Judah was his sanctuary, Israel his dominion, the sea saw it and fled. Judah, or Jordan, was driven back. And God brought the nation Israel out of Egypt. He led them to the Red Sea. And then He led them through the Red Sea. 
God says in His Word, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And sometimes God's people look at the way that God says He wants them to walk, and they say, you got to be kidding me. You really want me to do that, Lord? I have a hard time believing you're telling me to do this. Like the Israelites. It must have been how they felt. When God led them, up, led them up to the Red Sea. And God said, you're walking through that sea. Or when they got to the borders of the Promised Land, which is bordered by the Jordan River, and it was at flood stage, and God says, you're walking through that river. You're going to be kidding me. Am I hearing right? But they did it. God made it happen because they stepped out by faith and they obeyed the voice of God. The mountains skip like rams and the little hills like lambs. In other words, everything got out of the way of God's people. He made a path. Everything that needed to be moved was moved. God made sure of it. Lesson for us. Nothing that presumes to stand in our way of doing what God wants us to do will be allowed to stand for long. God just won't. He just won't allow it. The Bible says that God is in heaven. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. 5 and 6 What aileth thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? Thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back, ye mountains, that ye skip like rams, and ye little hills like lambs. God is saying, What's the matter, Red Sea? Why are you acting so strange? Why did you cut yourself in two? He's saying, What's the matter, Jordan River? Why did you stop flowing? You're at a flood stage. Why did you do that? That's kind of weird. You're both acting kind of strange. Why did you do that? because God wanted them to that's why and they obeyed when things and people act very uncharacteristic of themselves it can be a sign that God is doing something in them he is moving 7 tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord at the presence of the God of Jacob and the earth will tremble It trembled when God gave the law at Mount Sinai. It trembled when Jesus died on the cross. And it's going to tremble again when He returns. There are no tough guys in the presence of God. There are no big shots in the presence of God. Only trembling. And for those who will not repent, God says in Isaiah... Go hide under the rocks and hide in the ground from the dread of the Lord and they will do that. Men are going to faint. The mighty men of the the earth are going to faint. They're going to tremble. They're going to fall right over when Jesus returns. Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob who turned the rock into standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters. If God can cause a river of clear water to flow out of a dry rock, then he can do anything that he wants to do. It just goes to show, God does not just talk big and then not back it up. He backs it up. He talks big and he backs it up. And so the righteous can trust that God will bring about the good that he promises. And likewise, the wicked should tremble because, because God's going to punish them, as he says.